when people are given up, they put them together in a room where all the dying people go. And I was part of that, you know, they were all double my age. I was close to 40. And then, yeah, we were all going to die. And we did one night and it was so strange the whole room died and then it was my turn i just laid back and just watching what's gonna happen guy here welcome to my podcast my amazing guest today is etienne piersman what an episode this man is beautiful and we had an incredible conversation he's studied in cranial sacral therapy which i didn't know much about but when i probed him about his journey we end up spending a lot of the conversation around that it is mind-blowing and the way he shares and describes it was just incredible and what it means to be human he had an incredible spiritual awakening a near-death experience which he will share with you today so if you are watching i'm grateful Please share this with a loved one or friend. If you do get a lot out of it, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, leave some comments below, anything to help me continue to get these conversations out there because I feel they are deeply, deeply important. Here, myself in Australia with Live and Flow, who I work with Matt Omo and Petra Brozovic, we are continuing to get the word out there. We're running more retreats, more one-day workshops. Come and join us in one of them. I promise you, you won't regret it. If all that seems too much, we also offer a free seven days of meditation, which we get a fabulous response with links are below dive in any way you want thank you for listening i'm lost for words see you soon much love at the end welcome to the podcast thank you guy i'm happy to be here totally. it for it already feels like going to be one of those podcasts where we've just been chatting off air for 10 minutes and it's like we have to stop talking because there's too much great things coming out already that need to be recorded and share oh, ultimately yeah. with everyone else. It's a life story, you know, and it's more than a life story that I have to share, yeah. Well, I, I certainly hope I do you justice today, at the end. And what, one of my intentions of this podcast is always to make the listener feel like they're right here with us if they had a cup of coffee or whether they're driving or whatever they might be all so right. we'll see how we do all right i have a cup of tea <laughs> my my first question to you is and i i, I want to go off on a slightly different tangent today is why do you do what you do ha huh, i can't do anything else you know, it's my life's experience that I'm sharing with people. That's it. My life's experience. And, uh, you know, I can't do anything else because everything else is not mine. Yeah, I have to share my heart. I have to share what I discovered over these years. And uh, that's so much fun. I can see. And the fact that you take the time when you podcast regular, I see that you've been doing that and you're constantly wanting to share and give and share your wisdom to other people. And I feel honored actually truly to have you on this podcast today. My pleasure. And I want yeah. I, I want to take it back then. Let's go into the, 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 the bit that caught my attention instantly was that you um, had a staph infection in your 20s is that correct uh it was or, a little or, later. Or later it was a little later it was uh the end of my 30s yeah it's, okay you could say it was the end of my first life cycle in this life huh. yeah i had a few like life me. cycles yeah like you you know you hit the wall and you can't keep going you have to turn around and do something totally different and that staph infection, I'm so grateful for these bacteria to have helped me to realize, hey, Etienne, this is not working for you. You have to do something else. Yeah, wow. I, from that moment on, yeah, my relationship with bacteria and viruses for that matter totally changed. You know, like I invited them in my body, you could say, to help me realize something very, very drastic that I, on my own, I would not have been able to do that. Wow. What a, what a way to look at it. 
What were you doing before the staff infection? And what is a staff infection? Hold on to your seat. Yeah, I was a total <laughs> donkey before. So the staff infection was self-inflicted with dirty water. That's what happened. That's how low I got. And that being a junkie, I was, I'm a child of the 60s, yeah? And getting into all that stuff like dope, for me, was an escape out of my programming. Uh, the schools I went to, that was so horrible. I went to a school, there were no girls in the school, one of those things, yeah? It was really so strict that I had to do something to escape my upbringing. And in those days, yeah, going and smoking and later doing other stuff, you know, trying everything out, uh, it was the, was the thing to do in those days. Yeah, it was like an alternative way of being. So, yeah, for me also, that was the escape out of the programming. And it went, I went all the way. I went to the end of that uh Till my body gave up. And that made me, of course, made me change quite drastically. Wow. When you would when you had the staff infection, was it is it a was it a gradual decline or was it like falling off a cliff with your it health? Was fall, I knew. It was falling off the cliff. You know, the oh. staff infection, what it did. It started with, when I noticed this, was suddenly from one day to the other, I had no more energy. They had invaded my heart and were eating all my valves. So the blood instead going one way was going anyway, everywhere, yeah? So I realized at that moment something was wrong. And then almost immediately, these bacteria went to my kidneys. They're looking for food. Yeah, that, that's, they're not bad. They're just looking for food. And so they went to my kidneys and started eating kidney. So that's when I realized I couldn't pee anymore. And I started to blow up like a Michelin man, that balloon man. Yeah. And uh, they had, by the time that I realized that, I was so blown up. My skin was see-through because I couldn't get rid of the water, the toxins in my body. Wow. So one kidney, you know, of course, yeah, I panicked. I'm going to die. I panicked. I panicked. And looking in the mirror, I didn't recognize the face that I was looking at because it was blown up. But the strange thing also from inside, I didn't recognize the body anymore either because it was also different with all the water inside. So, yeah, total panic. And luckily, yeah, I went to a rehab center where I knew the people, where I knew they will take care of me. And, of course, they didn't know what to do. I was a lost case. Yeah, a really bad junkie. So, yeah, but at that moment, the total panic, and luckily I had a place to stay. And then, yeah, out of despair, they asked me, what can we do? And I knew they couldn't do anything for me. So I said, give me a room, you know, so I can meditate. <laughs> and I sat down, I started meditating, and after 30 minutes, something happened. It was like a click. Suddenly, I was into no mind. Suddenly, everything became clear. And the clarity was about, okay, I was so happy to have been a junkie. That was the part of the clarity. I did the life that I wanted to do, not what people told me to do, which was the upbringing. I had done what I wanted to do. I will not advise anybody to follow that. But for me, yeah, at that moment, all right, this is what I did. This is the result. And it was not like being happy about it or unhappy about it. It was just a, the clarity of, hey, this is it. And there was, yeah, later, you know, you read all these books and you have words of it about it, it was like a cosmic indifference. 
it was totally fine what I was going through. Whether I would stay alive or die, it didn't matter at all. I had done my thing and I was happy with that. And that state, you know, of being in total no mind, it lasted for more than a year. And then slowly, the mind, yes, the mind started coming back slowly. Shall I go on with uh, the story? Keep going, keep going. Yes, so, yeah. All right. There was this clarity in a totally ruined body. The body was still totally ruined. So they took me to the hospital because they couldn't take care of me. I had to sleep like this with my head here. Otherwise, the water in my body would go to my brain. And this 45 so, degree angle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so right in the hospital, they gave me, you know, medication to get rid of the uh, stuff infection. And that worked, although they're still in my body. I know they're still there a little bit. And uh, yeah, that's a different story. But, you know, I got rid of the, they got rid of the staph infection. And also they gave him medication to keep the kidneys going. But then they did tests, you know, and my heart was still ruined. No valves. My left kidney was 67% dead material. And my right kidney, 87 or 89, I forgot the number, dead material. You can't live with that, you know, with a heart that doesn't pump and kidneys that don't function. So once, you know, I got better in a sense that I could pee and there were no more staph infection. And then they gave me this handful of medication to keep me going. I told the doctor, look, this is going to kill me. <laughs> it was funny to say that, but... This is going to kill me, these medications. I'm out of here. So I had to sign a paper. And then I had one friend left. Uh, so I call him. And, uh, I, I, you know, this was in the Netherlands, in Europe. And I said, can you take me to the Ardennes in Belgium? They have huge forests still there. And I knew I had to go into the forest, into nature. I didn't know what for, but I knew I wanted to get out of the society and go into nature. So we drove a whole day. I didn't know where to go. He didn't know where to go. So, But I was guiding him, go here, go there, go da, 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 da. Suddenly we're in a dead end. We couldn't go any farther. It was already 10 o'clock at night. It was in the summer, luckily. So, all right, we set up shop, you know, a tent, a little tent. The car was there. We went in the tent and I just couldn't stand the, you know, his energy, basically. It was too stressed out also from driving the whole day. So I left the tent and I started wandering in the forest and just, just walking, walking, walking. And then suddenly I saw a little clearing, you know, like trees were almost creating a pavilion type of thing. And I saw in that clearing there was a light, you know, it was like lighted from inside out. And I, I went in there, I thought, wow, this is a place to sleep. And it was a pine forest, so it was very cushiony, you know, like layers and layers of pine needles was so nice. So I went to sleep there. I closed my eyes, lay down, closed my eyes. As soon as I did that, I was out of my body, watching the body, you know, and I could really feel, you know, this is the body. This is not me. This is just the body laying there. Mm -hmm. And I was, you know, like a presence looking at it. And then all these things started to happen. Animals coming by, looking, sniffing, snakes, foxes, little rodents, a boar, you know, huge female with, I think, 10 or 12 of those little ones all sniffing. Nobody touched me. And what I saw was the respect of those animals for what was happening. What was really happening, I could see, you know, they understood. I didn't, but they understood what was happening. All right, so in the morning, the sun comes up and the heat of the sun allowed me 
to go back in the body. So I sat there the whole day. At night, same thing happened. So four days and nights, this thing happened. And my friend, you know, he came by once in a while with a little bit of soup. Yeah, it was nice. Some tea once in a while. But I was basically just sitting there, not even meditating. There was nothing happening there was it was just blank i didn't have to do anything so after four days i told them all right let's go back it's done whatever it is it's done and we went back to the netherlands and a few days later i went to the hospital and they checked and my heart <laughs> you know this is so crazy but my heart was totally healed all the valves were working, and my kidneys a hundred percent working. This was 1986, and I'm still here without wow. any medication. You know, so there was this thing that happened. Yeah, wow! But I left the pizza. <laughs> Can I ask a couple of questions? Oh, yeah, go ahead. If you want. Yeah, <laughs> I. I, I you know, I, I need no convincing. I've seen enough and experienced enough in my own life to what you've just described there. Yeah. And hence why I'm so passionate about this podcast and having these conversations. I just didn't expect you to share all that. Uh, that was your journey. That was incredible. You said you spent a year after the diagnosis. And were you at home? And were you just given medication? Were you in pain? Or were you beyond the pain? Were you in a, just a meditative state daily? When, how did you navigate that year? And how did members of the family show up or people in your life? Because it'd be very easy for them to impose themselves upon you. You should be doing this. You should be doing that. You know, I made sure I'll answer that last thing about family first. When I went into that, yeah, that episode of being a junkie, I disconnected totally from the family. I didn't want them, not in the beginning, you know, I was begging for money for a while from my mom, but, you know, that was just in the very beginning. But at a certain point, I realized, hey, I'm on my own. I don't want to involve any of my the people that I know of my former life, of my family. I don't want to get them involved with my life. So I disconnected from them. And also, after the episode happened, there is still that disconnect. I totally disconnected from my family. Uh, I connected later, you know, like 20, 30 years later. I connected again with them, but I left them out of that episode. Then I was in pain for quite a bit when before the meditation. The moment that thing happened in the meditation, all pain was gone. There was uh, as if, yeah, I, I surpassed it somehow. I went into a state where pain is not happening. In you, you disconnect, basically. That was what I was feeling. Although in those days, you know, that word didn't come up. I realized that later, but I disconnected totally from the body. Yeah, it was like an entity, but uh, the feeling of it, that disconnect was happening. So with the medication also, when the medication happened, when I got that medication, I could feel the body cringe. But it was not me being cringing and, you know, uh, disappearing in the pain. There was that, that disconnect state and that disconnect is still there. Yeah, with the body. But there was another thing that I didn't talk about um, before that uh, I went to the woods. There was an episode. Of course, my body was so ruined. And with all the medication, they killed the, uh, yeah, the, most of the bacteria. But my body was still yeah, ruined to such a point that it couldn't stay alive. It, it was in, unable to stay alive. So there was an episode in the hospital where they put me in a ward. Yeah, you've been in the hospital. You know how it works. When people are given up, they put them together in a room, you know, where all the dying people go. Uh, 
And I was part of that. You know, they were all double my age. I was close to 40. Yeah, I was in a in a ward with 80, 90 year old people. And then or yeah, we were all going to die. And we did one night, and that was so strange. The whole room died, yeah, one after the other. And f- it was like, a, yeah, like a, a TV show almost. I was laying there, you know, totally sane, totally clear, and I could see everybody, one after the other, going to a dying process through it, and how they the candle went out for them, and all of them a little different, yeah. And then the person next to me, it was like one after the other, and then the person next to me, he couldn't. He started to panic so much, and then of course the nurses came and the curtains went down, and I could hear clanging, you know. So they injected him, and at a certain point, you know, everything went quiet, and they just sent him out with a syringe. Yeah, they opened up the curtain, and he, he was covered, so I knew what happened. And then it was my turn. And, uh, you know, I just laid back, you know, just watching what's going to happen. I didn't know what's going to happen. I knew I was going to die. But how? And then I went through a few phases of hot and cold. And, you know, I read later, yeah, in descriptions how the body goes through stages. You know, you become uh, cold, you you cold sweat and Really, then you burn up and then you explode, something like that. Well, that's the the most drastic thing that I remember, the explosion. When the thing happened that I just became the universe. It was like I became the Milky Way. Millions and millions of dots, you know, all expansion, total expansion. And then the most crazy thing happened. Suddenly, I was back in my body, standing next to my bed. The person next to me was the last one in the row. And he couldn't. Something happened with his heart that he needed something. And that need of that person brought me suddenly back in the body. And I, the first thing I felt was my body doesn't fit anymore. It didn't match but I went over to him and this is another crazy thing I put my hand on his heart and I was still in that space of expansion and I saw my hand going into his chest touching his heart directly of course that's not possible but you know that was the space I was in so I really touched his heart really literally yeah, go figure it out. But all right. So suddenly there was this shivering going through him and it something happened. He stayed alive. He didn't die. We became really good friends afterwards. But, you know, I was back in the body, still in that no mind space. And that's after a few days later, I decided uh, to go to the woods. But the experience of dying, wow. That's basically what I found back in craniosacral. Yeah, the experience of that silence, that uh, letting go. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Huh. wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Were you? So you you were in were you in the hospital for the entire year? Is that... No, no, no. I think I was in the hospital close to two weeks. And then you ended up back in there yeah. before you... Yeah, yeah. Right. Got it. And had you had any meditation oh, practice? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Prior to all of this? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I, my because, meditation practice started, I think, 1974. Uh, Off and on, you know, I was in and out of rehab. And that was the days that the uh, dynamic meditation started, bioenergetics started, primal scream started. Uh, the very first 
you had therapy, alternative therapy started to happen. And in those rehab centers, that's where they were experimenting with that. So I had connected with that. At one point, I was for two full years in a rehab center getting totally clean and doing a lot of meditation. I was even a counselor for drug addicts at one point. Uh, but somehow that was not complete. Uh, that that program, yeah, it was not a full program. It, because I went back into into yeah being an addict after that for a, for a few years before this thing happened. But yes, I knew you know the, about meditation and what it can bring, what it will bring if you're going for it. Yeah, mm, yeah, because. Listening to you share your story, which is just so beautiful, it's incredible. Um, you speak about you were very anxious when you first got diagnosed, like, oh, you know, you went into fear and, oh, my God, I'm going to oh. die. And, and But then I, I, I haven't heard you speak of it in the year or even in the woods. Had you made peace with yourself during that time? The moment and that, even that it clicked, total peace happened. You know, I knew that whatever I did was my own doing. I knew that whatever drugs I took, it was my own doing. And, uh, yeah, I had total peace with that, even the fact that I was going to die. First, there was the panic. Ah, I'm going, I'm going, it's it's over. But then the, the meditation happened and the no mind happened. And from that no mind, I could see that I did what I wanted to do. That I did, now I can say that, what I needed to do. Yeah, I needed to be free from my upbringing. And that was my way, you know, to to go there. And you could say I was lucky or uh, I was guided somehow. Um, yeah, through a, a no mind field to to do what I was doing. And, you know, it, there were moments of total despair when I was a junkie, total despair. But um, in the 70s, I became a sannyasin. I connected to Bhagwan Osho Rajneesh in Pune and became a sannyasin. And I could feel, you know, that uh, his presence when I was in deep, deep despair, it makes me a bit emotional. But when I was in deep despair, I could feel his presence guiding or not guiding, but comforting me. Like, it's okay. It's uh, whatever you're doing, you know, keep going. <laughs> Suddenly you wow. disappear from the screen when I'm talking about it. I'm I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> but I think it's just the internet. Yeah, yeah all right. <laughs> Nothing magical. Uh but you know, the moment that that I was brought back by the guy next to me, it was that I, I can see now, yeah, that somehow my story, what I went through, is something to share with people. And what I got from that story is to be able to share no mind, to be able, mm. you know, in cranio, to share that no mind space with people, to bring them to that no mind space very easily. So, yeah. Wow. Because once you experience that, then it's it, it's I all the what I found was all the podcasts, all the books, everything I read, everything I did. It was never it was just intellectual intellectualized, and it wasn't embodied yeah. until you yeah. have an experience. And yeah. It's, yeah. talk talk about a picture says a thousand words. Well, an embodied experience paints. Yes, totally. Wow, totally. So yeah, it's logical that I work with bodies with touch, with conscious touch and what that is, yeah, what what you can do with that. So I have to ask you then, when you got up from the forest, 
and go back. A, how did the doctors respond? Oh, when the, Total disbelief. And the, Disbelief. Total disbelief. But, you know, looking at me like I'm a freak of nature, which, yeah, I was nature, but not a freak. Yeah, I, <laughs> I went into nature without... Yeah, without really knowing that I'm going to find the answer there. I just knew I got, I got to go into nature because medication was not going to help me at all. It was going to kill me. It was going to kill the body. And uh, I didn't know. Actually, I had no clue what would happen in nature absolutely not, that I had to go lay down, I had no clue. It just was an, an intuition that I followed. Mm. Because I couldn't do anything else, Guy. I couldn't do anything else. Yeah, I was out of options. And because of your experience in the hospital, a few days before you went into nature, yeah. When you said you 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 know this is it, I'm going to die. Yeah. Did that then did that then dissipate any last fear when going into the forest? Were you fully accepting in that space when you went in? There was no fear anymore. Hmm. There was nothing anymore. There was just just a, a journey, you know. Uh, all right, let's go to the forest. Let's. It was a, a, like going on vacation. It was not even the idea that I was going to heal myself or that something was going to heal me. It was like, all right, let's get out of here. This, what I went through, this is the end of it. Let's get to, into something totally different. And I called my friend to go to the, to the forest, li literally like going on a vacation. I had no clue at that point. My mind okay. was not there to have a clue. It was like a, a guidance. How would, like looking back with everything you've learned since, and obviously that experience happening, what do you put it down to, the, the, that healing? Well, like if, if somebody goes, oh, like, well, well, well how did that happen? Like, what is the wisdom you you look back upon all of that and go, well, this is what I think happened? I think, you know, the the most important thing is is just trust in intuition. Total trust in uh, whatever is going to happen is going to happen. And for me, you know, going through that death experience and finding that dying, yeah, is not a big deal. It is just something that you can watch happening to the body. Yeah, I, it was, I was just, yeah, being, yeah, you, whatever you would call it, a, a witness, yeah, being pure awareness, seeing what happens to the body. Yeah, that, that was what was happening. And, you know, to bring it into words, to involve mind, yeah, that came later. You had to give it a place so the mind can understand. But at that point, there was nothing there to understand what was happening. It was just happening. It was just an experience that I had. And my mind came back, of course, later, you know, to function in the world. Uh, yeah, my brain got healthy again, so there was a mind again. And now I can explain all these things. But that mo at that moment, there was even no need to explain. Mm. Wow. So what did you do with that? Once you had that experience, well, you've, you've been told your body's 100% back. Yes. You must have had a smile on your face. Well, yeah, back. yeah, yeah, of course. But, you know, the body was so weak after that. I had to regain, okay. I had to find my strength back. And it took me about a year. Uh, luckily, another friend took me in where I could stay for a year. It was a really nice place. Um, yeah also in the woods, and uh, it took me about a year to recover. And then, you know, I went to, to Pune, to India, to, uh, yeah, I had to go there uh, to offer my thanks and also my energy to, to Osho. 
And uh, I arrived there about a month before he left his body. So I had the happiness of still meeting him. And uh, yeah, you know, then I also took a a rebalancing course, which is a, a massage course that lasted four months nonstop. I needed that for my body to yeah, bring my body totally, totally back in line, so to speak. And in there, there was a four-day workshop about cranio. And uh, massage I didn't like too much doing, but it was good for my body. But when I connected to cranio, I knew this is it. This is for me. And that's how I rolled into it. This is for me the experience that brings me closest to the experience of dying. That no mind space where you go in when you, when the body stops functioning, when you start decomposing, the body does that. And that silence and no mind space of letting go basically. And that's what I saw in Cranio that, uh, yeah, it was the easiest way to keep on living because I couldn't go to a job or anything Yeah, that didn't work for me. And that's what cranio is all about. You know, you just touch somebody, you don't do anything, and then the silence starts to happen. Wow, yeah. That was wow. my entry into it. Into cranial. So then let's let's move into that because most people, you know, might have heard the word cranial, craniosacral therapy, or whatever it might be. And you're speaking of touch and going beyond the mind as well. Yeah. Like yeah. like if you know, I'm one of them, like what's what is how would you describe cranio then if you know even if i was 12 years old like how does that support us well you know the word cranio cranium sacral sacrum yeah what we do what what actually happens is we are able to yeah feel the different bones in the brain and it's so easy you know it it's just a way of fine tuning your senses that's all it is. And what we do, actually, the actual uh, physicality of it is giving maximum space to the brain and giving maximum space to the spine. And that's what organizes the body, the spine, the spinal cord and the brain, the nerve system. If you give maximum space to that, yeah, everything else will follow the lead of that yeah, opening up. Yeah. And it's basically bringing the body, giving it back its resources. It's not, it started as a therapy going after problems, but it changed, you know, the way that I do this, yeah, is opening up the the person to get them back to what is there already in the body, yeah, not going after problems, yeah, but just opening everything up so a person uh, feels their life force totally. That's what craniosacral is all about. Wow. And one of the things we use is conscious touch, yeah, which is the simplest thing. You just put your hand somewhere and you wait. You don't move. You wait. And then you notice what is the pinky feeling? What is this one and this one? What are they all feeling? And when you start doing that, it brings instant mindfulness, instant. The mind just stops because, hey, you're totally into feeling. And then a few other things start happening. After a minute of that, the brain starts to produce oxytocin which is, yeah, we call it the love hormone. It is what what mom and baby produce to create that love. So when that starts to happen, one of the effects of it is also that the mind stops. You go totally in a no mind space. And there's a whole bunch of, of tricks that I use, you know, to bring a person 
in that space. And one, yeah, I can't deny that, but one of the tricks I use is my voice. Because when I go there, my voice changes into, yeah, it, it starts coming from, from a no-mind space, not from the mind anymore. You know, it's a little hypnotic. And it's easy then, because I go there and I pull people with me in that no-mind space. You know, it's one of the things, one of the gifts I got from that whole experience of dying and healing, all that, yeah, left me with, yeah, a voice that can do that. Yeah. Wow. So obviously you've got a reference point Oh yeah, because of your experiences, and then you're then bringing that into the work, essentially. Yeah. So, with that, then, what is the the, the fundamental philosophy? Like, what, what, who, and what are we as human beings? Are we energetic beings having a physical experience, and the nervous system is a conduit to something far greater than us? Are we holding that information within the body? In, in, in the information, you know, all our experiences and we're reorganizing, like, how would you do well, an it, overview? It is what you say. You know, we are having this experience of being in a body and to be in this world, you need a body. Without a body, you cannot experience each other. You cannot experience touch. You cannot yeah, enjoy life as is. Yeah, we are having that experience. And yeah, what we do with cranio is changing the experience from coming through the mind, which is basically seeing the world, experiencing life, forced by your education and your parents, how they see the world. Yeah, that is a forced expression of the world it's not yours yeah you follow the lead of other people so with mm -hmm. our cranio we can change that from the experience of everything according to your mind if you shut down the mind and then there is this experience of of no mind yeah and that's the life force that created the body the body is created not by the mind. The mind starts happening when you're two, three years old. Then it starts happening, but then the body is already created. This magnificent body with a brain, unbelievable what it can do, is created by the life force, yeah, by nature. Yeah, and to fully go into that experience, yeah, you if you're able to come from a no-mind space in life, then life will be different. You know, you it becomes more real. It becomes more according to nature and not according to your upbringing or your schooling or all these things. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's simple. that resonates. It's so Boy, I spent, I spent 40 years deconditioning myself before my <laughs> yeah yeah so do you uh, would you say then that the body's internal wisdom is you're giving it permission to find the, the natural harmony the rhythm it should be yes which in in turn then i'm just trying to choose my words carefully in turn if there are elements of us that are out of alignment you're given that permission to heal or reset itself or come back into alignment yeah that's exactly what it is you know aligning yourself with cosmic forces with with what creates life the creation of life yeah if you can align yourself with that which is very easy because it created you so that's basically what we do in our courses, yeah, to look at the things that are out of alignment and then, you know, finding ways, and that's quite simple, actually, finding ways to open that up and 
you know, one of the things, one of you could say the principles that I follow uh, when the body is being created, uh, yeah, at the very beginning, there is no body yet. There is just a bunch of cells, stem cells. They have no form. They're just blobs. But they can absorb the life force and focus the life force into creation. They start, yeah, cre they start cloning like crazy. And then, you know, and this is the thing that, that, that is so amazing. At a certain point, you have this amount of stem cells. And then a line appears, a straight line. And when the line doesn't appear, all these cells, they keep on growing, creating forms, nails, eyes, bones, skin, hair. But something that cannot stay alive, it's like stem cells have to create, but just chaotic. When the line comes, suddenly, yeah, total clarity for all the stem cells. And they suddenly know what their life's purpose is going to be where in the body they need or how to create a body, their migration to certain areas, and also their sense of timing, when to go, when to wait. Yeah, this, That midline brings total clarity to all the cells, and then a body is created. And that's what we do with clients. We go back to that midline. We go back to that space of stem cells and that is a space where a total no mind is happening because there is no brain yet so there cannot be a brain yet and that's one of the things we can do in no mind go back in wow. in that space of no time absolute no time and also to a place where pure energy is available no form yet huh. So I'm just going to repeat back just so I ensure I'm grasping it and then the listeners are as well. Yeah. So then would you, correct? obviously you'll correct me if I'm wrong, a stem cell is effectively a cell coming online. So it's coming from the field into physical form and it hasn't been given instructions yet, okay. hence why it's a stem okay. cell. Yeah. That's, that's correct, yeah. And then you've got a field of information that is currently then telling the stem cell what to do. Yes, and you, you're explaining it better than I can. That field, <laughs> yeah, you know, that field of information comes into the form in the form of a line, just a straight line. Yeah, we call that the midline. And okay. that's when the information comes. That's where suddenly it's like a flash of lightning. Suddenly everybody knows what to do. And then they create a book. Wow. So is it fair to say then, as I explore this in my own mind, that if still, if we have a, like cells coming online every second right now, yes. stem cells are effectively yes. coming on and turning over and they need to express their life, yes. express themselves. So if we, if we are suffering with a problem oh. of some sort, physical, then if we can change the information through the, the life force, help that realign back to its natural state, yes. it will then give a different signal to the stem cell coming online, which in turn could actually help reorganize and heal the issue that we're having on because the information is different to the cell that's coming on because yes. they will effectively all turn over. It's actually exactly how it works. When you connect to somebody and you bring that midline back, and that's very easy because as a practitioner, that's what you learn in the classes. You have to come from that no mind space. So when we bring the client in that no mind space and at that point, we are connected 100% with the client. And then both bodies are in the no mind field. And that is so powerful. It's like a quantum leap. Suddenly the client not only has their own energy, but somebody else that's totally open. And then that midline field will push everything that is unnatural 
everything that is not aligned, it will push it to the surface. So the person will you feel the physicality that is not aligned, but also the emotional parts that need to be dumped and the mental things that are not able to dissolve. Everything will pop up, will become become visible. And then it becomes easy to work with it because it naturally rises to the surface and becomes visible for the client, but also sure. for the person working, doing, helping them to yeah, go into that field of, of no mind. And it's a very easy process. Wow. I'm blown away. <laughs> I can't believe <laughs> It's from so far. I'm in New Mexico in the US. Yeah. It's amazing. Like I, I'm, I'm getting emotional listening to you because I work with people. Like I, I worked with over 150 people last weekend in person, myself, my business. And we use sound, we use breath, we use oh, meditation. Wow. Yeah, yeah. We use touch, intuitive yeah. aspects and, and help people really come to that place that you speak of and to, to surrender in, to allow the wisdom of the body to start to reorganize itself. And listening to you share that, I'm like, it's, it's, it's incredible. Everything about me resonates right now. I'm like, of wow, course, yeah. amazing. It's because you know. you know that no mind space, that's why you resonate. Mm. You know it. Yeah. Yeah, very well. The Can you, do you, like, do all people, like, do, do, is there only practitioners that learn this or do, do people learn it for their own family and things? Well, it's, it's becoming or... more and more of a movement at this point, you know, the, I've been working with this, you know, it, it, that thing happened in 1986. I started practicing in 1990, 1989. That's when I started. So there is a whole mushrooming of uh of this but you know it's it's um uh, i teach whoever wants to be taught and you know preferably here in new mexico we have people coming from all over the world actually to uh you know once once they hear this yeah it it uh, attracts people and everybody can learn it you know you do not need any any physical knowledge about the body. You know, it's one of the things that I changed. I don't come from an anatomical um, model. Yeah, I, okay. I try to teach in such a way that a five-year-old even could understand what I'm talking about. Before, I use the language, spontaneous language, not not um, cultured language that you learn at school. Of course, you know, a sphenoid bone will be a sphenoid bone and a frontal bone is a frontal bone. Those things mm. don't change. But, you know, it's it's something that everybody can learn. Everybody. And do you teach from New Mexico in person now when people well, come and spend a week with you or...? Yeah, we have a base here, but you know, I'm I'm traveling all over the world. Uh, I'm going to Taiwan, uh, to Hong Kong, uh, uh, Prague. Uh, you know, we we're just starting also with online classes. You know that people can have a taste of it online. And one of the other things I'm starting uh, in uh, August in Mexico, we do. Uh, a master class about the brain, you know, uh, where people come that have no clue. They have no clue about cranio, no clue about the brain. And I'm teaching them how to touch and everything about the brain and how to work with brains. Um, yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, a, a real explosion a real movement of of cranio is happening at this point and uh I, yeah I, you can see how enthusiastic i am about it I, <laughs> can, I, I i can and i can believe it i i, I feel 
No, it's now or never in in, in our world, to be Absolutely. honest. Absolutely. You know? Yes, yes. And the world, people are so ready, you know, to take healing as mm. something that they can do themselves. Yeah, it's not they don't have to go to hospital. It's right in your hands. Are, are we able to perform cranial on ourselves or does it need to be two independent people to uh, it is of course much more fun if somebody does it for you yes because then you can totally let go but it's one of the things that we are developing also a few videos about all right how do you do this yourself yeah how can you very easily yeah for instance you know behind this bone there is the human brain the frontal cortex how can you give it space yeah and it's very easy actually how to do these things on your own so we're at this point that's one of our projects is to bring a few videos online yeah how to do self-help with cranio wow We're, we have like uh, i'm running out of time here but we haven't even touched trauma cancer oh, you know the th all all these things that we spoke about right and and with the, the body that we could get into um but i'm, I'm gonna go and find a, a local therapist and just try it because i've you. never had the experience myself yeah. and I'll, I'll i'll let you know how it goes all right you, you know right but, again would you yeah please come back would you come back on the podcast at the end in the future I'd absolutely be... i need to share this with the whole world yeah i can tell yeah and i'm just feeling your 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 just your honesty in the way you the way you speak and share from the heart at the end is so beautiful and uh, uh yeah i'm i'm so glad that you came on the podcast today and i can share this will reach thousands of people and i, yeah. and I hope it will bring much more awareness to you and your work i'm curious i'm really my brain is ticking away in the background thinking how can i how can i get in front no, of you somehow <laughs> you know there is a we have a an entry into the website it's it's called cranio rocks like rock and roll cranioRocks.com. people can go and look at what we're doing yeah it's very easy amazing any um any last words of wisdom or anything to leave our listeners to ponder on today after everything we've covered so far? Oh, yeah. yes. People know. People know what to do. You know, get out of your head and uh, go into nature. You know, you can meet. You can meet uh, anything. Your guru, your uh, nature, your guide. Nature itself is your guide. Go in the silence of nature. You know, it will, it will help you tremendously. Mm. And of course, in future, come to my classes. <laughs> thousand percent, thousand percent. Yeah, yeah. I, nature is so healing, isn't it? That's why I live near the ocean. Oh, right. I'm sure. Yes. I'm, uh, I know Byron Bay. Yes. Mm. Yeah. So just can you say your URL, your website out one more time for people? I'll ensure the links are in the show notes as well. The website is craniorocks.com. Cranial rocks. Okay. And then they go to uh, our official website. Yeah. Yeah. Got you. Perfect. Thank you so much for coming on and, and sharing, which I think, like I said, we've just scratched the, the surface. I didn't even quiz you about being at the Osho Meditation Center and what you learned. Yeah. You know, there's so many aspects. And they, anyway, anyway, I'm sure there'll be a part two at some stage and, and getting into your work a lot more as well. Thank you so much. My pleasure.